quickly move it over to the panel at this time and ask Marcus to introduce his thoughts on consciousness and mind uploading. Over to Marcus. Okay. So, maybe I should, I'm not a philosopher, so it's a layman's perspective. Yeah. Um, we won't hold that against you. Sorry, what? We won't hold that against you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think the idea of mind uploading so raises a lot of philosophical questions, I mean, about identity, um, self, consciousness, and so they all become now practically important, these philosophical things. Yeah. Sometimes philosophy can be practically relevant. Um, so there was this great talk by Andrew Dunn about zombies, and um, so my position on zombies is that I don't believe in them, um, but maybe more interesting is why I don't believe in zombies. Um, so I'm a scientist made most of the time, or maybe a mathematician, yeah, but if I'm not a mathematician, then I'm a scientist. And um, well, the scientific method is um, you make experiments and you falsify your theories, and if many theories are left over which are consistent with your data, then you choose the simplest one among these theories. Okay? So if, if I take this as a premise, and then I consider the zombie hypothesis, yeah, so there could be sort of hum normal humans and there could be zombie humans, they behave identically, then sort of nearly by definition you cannot distinguish between them, and then I have two theories, you know, one that these zombies exist, or no, sort of only one kind of intelligence exists, namely sentient humans and others sort of who feel really something. And, well, the latter theory is simpler, right? I only postulate one entity rather than two different entities. So from a scientific perspective, um, I don't believe in zombies, yeah? Um, but on the other hand, I think it's an interesting philosophical question, and philosophers should continue to think about it, and maybe ultimately someone comes up with an experimental test of zombiness. Um, I doubt that because sort of by definition you're not able to do that, but who knows, yeah? Or maybe the scientific method, you know, has to change in the really? future and to adapt, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so not believing in zombies and being a functionalist, yeah, I mean, being a scientist is sort of nearly guides you towards being a functionalist because, I mean, if you can't measure differences, you know, then you don't postulate differences. And um, that probably implies my, 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 most of my other beliefs in uploading. So I think, you know, consciousness survives, feelings survive, identity survives with uploading, whether gradual or um, instantly, uh, or you store your first self and then you reactivate yourself, or you duplicate yourself. I think all this is fine, you know, don't worry. Uh, I think that's all I have to say. Okay, Colin, would you like to give your take on the subject? Of uploading? Uh, yep. Yeah. Wow. Well, I have to have an opinion on uploading. Yeah, don't, don't squish your brain. Oh, sorry, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would like to create the problem of the option of uploading by building something that you could upload into, and that's where I'm going to stop. Um, I'm not going to... The, the, the issues around surrounding uploading as a concept I'll leave to others to talk about. Um, my take on the process of uploading and whether consciousness would survive is that unless it's a particular kind of substrate, it won't. And my practical work involves the retention of the physics involved in cognition in the same way that the physics of flight were retained by the Wright brothers and they flew, and the physics of combustion are retained when you cook dinner. You don't compute dinner. I am going to manufacture something that retains the essential physics of cognition. It's nowhere near as exciting as combustion or flying. It's very difficult to tell when it's cognizing. It's nowhere near as obvious that it's still got everything in it. Nevertheless, there are recent neuroscience outcomes that give us a pretty good clue about the essential physics that's going on there and there are two different kinds of signalling. Uh, one involves action potentials and the other one involves what's called ephapsis which is coupling by electromagnetic fields. So my idea is simple, I'm just going to retain both those things and build a chip architecture that will have an EEG signal like a human and then proceed from there. 
um, the way to upload into a substrate made of these things. Um, wow, I, I think it might be possible, but um, I've got a lot more problems to solve <laughs> before I worry about that. Uh, what I do know is that my approach is quite different to the, my um, uh, my friends here. <laughs> friends? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he just doesn't have friends when he sees it. Um, and that I hope that um, diversity of approaches is one that's appreciated by the community in general. Um, I seem to be pretty much alone in this, although the technique that is to learn about uh, to learn about uh, combustion by burning things, and to learn about flying by flying, uh, I'm going to learn about cognition by building things that cognize, literally, using the same physics, and thereby learn about cognition, So, um, rather than compute models of it. And maybe that will inform the, uh, the whole sphere sufficiently to move on then to uploading into it. I think I'll leave it there. Okay, I guess it's up to me to, to, to respond to both things in a way. Um, so I guess one, one point where I really agree with Colin is um, that we do need to be open to uh, looking very carefully at the ways in which, um, in which the physics or the signals that are involved in the system uh, matter to to the emergent phenomena of uh, mind, consciousness, everything else. Um, I think actually that's one of the most important aspects of what I, I try to do, is to try to keep an uh, objective view of, of where we're trying to go with this. So uploading as an objective, that's something that you're trying to accomplish, not as a pet theory, not as something where, let's say, I say, it has to be done this way. We need to use integrated fire neurons, and we need to get that data by I don't know, by like using EEG or something like that. If you have one pet method of approaching the problem, if this is, you're, you're already convinced that this is how you need to do it, then you're probably wrong. So I think that's one of the most important things to keep in mind, that uh, you need to be open to new ideas, you need to be open to the fact that there are going to be errors and flaws in your thinking and in your models, and that you will have to adapt them and adjust them and bring in new signals, for example. So for instance, the adaptive coupling might be something that you need to put in there. Um, that said, I think that still, and this was actually something we discussed over lunch because of uh, uh, certain topics that came up during Colin's talk, a lot of the disagreements often are more about terminology and how we understand what someone else is saying rather than the fact that we somehow basically disagree or that we are somehow different scientists who are not quite a, or maybe one of them is not as open to all the possible ideas as the other. So say, for example, the topic of computation, whether or not um, a mind with consciousness could be produced using a computational device, or whether you need to build um, special hardware for it. So when Colin talks about this, it sounds as if they're two very different things. And I think that's because when he says computation, he's thinking of a very specific kind of computation. When I think of computation, mostly I just think in terms of, well, so we have a mathematical way of describing the system, and we can run it through its paces if we have a device that can operate on, on data. Um, and in, obviously this is something that our minds do as well. We operate on data that we're receiving all the time. The signals don't need to be digital. They can be analog. There can be a variety of different things that play a role that are factors in it. And you can make all kinds of devices to carry out these computations. These devices could be digital computers. If it turns out that all we need is a good sampling rate to get a good idea of what the signals are that the neurons are using, and that we can just represent that in the system. It's kind of like the old debate between audio files as to whether CDs are you know, not as good as vinyl for some reason. Um, or maybe we need to make special hardware for it as possible. But I think that's something where, again, we need to just continue looking at the objective and not so much at your pet theory. The other matter, okay, getting back to the question of consciousness, and consciousness or not, and how we describe it and whether we believe in zombies, um, 
it's a wonderful question. It's, it's nice to think about. Uh, for uploading, that's not even, I think, the most um, delicate question, not the one that most people worry about when they think about uploading. Um, when people think about uploading, sometimes they do ask, yes, are you going to be able to reproduce consciousness in a machine? But really what they want to know is, can you reproduce my consciousness? Can I be put into that machine? So it's not just about making consciousness appear in the machine. It's about your own identity, your self-awareness. And uh, Marcus already stated his position, which is that you can do basically anything to it. You can stop it, start it up again, whatever. It's still you. Not everyone feels that way. A lot of people think that if, um, if you were to die at this moment and someone uh, chronically suspends your, your body or your brain, keeps it somewhere, then eventually you're sliced up by a machine and someone makes a 3D reconstruction and then from that uh, figures out what the functions are supposed to be and then builds a, a computer and runs you in another robotic body, that even though the, the ultimate robot with your brain in there, or the, the new emulated representation of your brain, will say, I have all the same memories, and I feel exactly the same, of course I'm him. Well, there's no way of testing that, of course, because you know you could build, you could make a two-line program that says, yes, I'm Randall. That's easy. I guess that's simple. <laughs> yes, it, it just says, print, I am Randall. The, the program gives you exactly that response. So the response itself is not evidence of the fact that it works. Um, the, uh, the question is, what happened to the one who died and, and the ground was suspended? At that point, did that personal identity, that self-awareness, disappear? Did it kind of stay in stasis until it reappears? Does that even mean anything to say that? Because if it's all emergent, is it all just an illusion? And um, people really do come down on two sides of that fence. And I have to be honest in saying, as I already did during my talk, that I have always been a fence sitter on this one. So what that means is that any time someone comes to me with one side of the argument, I will argue the opposite. And um, that's been going on for quite a while. I think that's a really interesting topic, and, and we haven't really talked about that when we talked about whether consciousness is possible in a machine or not, and what consciousness. We haven't talked about persistence of things like self-identity, self-awareness, and what, how that may tie into consciousness. Response. Shall yeah, we take okay, questions? So, or? I just wanted to know if anybody wanted to respond to the last. Yeah, did you want anybody uh, want to respond to, uh, to Randall? There? Um, yeah, but I've forgotten what it was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, what is this? If you go asleep and you're not in a dream phase, you're also unconscious and then you sort of wake up. So, you could also argue, you know, this is a new person. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think there is something different to say? Assume you don't change the substrate; you freeze somebody and then you you unfreeze him and so leave him in a biological body. Yeah, um, probably you 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 would also be offended that maybe this is not the same person anymore. Or and if so, then what is the difference between freezing and unfreezing and going to sleep? It gets it gets into so many difficult questions here because and everything turns into matters of degree. Because you can, of course, say that, yes, well, sleeping isn't exactly the same thing as being dead or being in a coma because they're all different degrees and some things are still active and some things are not. And maybe it depends on what's still active and, and, and whatever states are somehow continuously connected in time and place. You can come up with so many questions for which there, in my opinion, aren't any real answers yet at this point. And it even gets down to things such as, well, if we live in a quantum universe in which basically every moment in time is not continuously connected, does it mean that we are always jumping from, you know, being in different states? And is the question there for something we're simply used to actually, and we're pretending that there's an issue here? Um, and and it goes on like that. So the truth is simply that, or in my opinion, the truth is that we can't um, we can't simply do away with this question at this moment because there may be things involved in achieving what we would call a successful upload that involve some attention to continuity even if that continuity doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you're the same, whatever that means. Because there's another aspect to this matter of continuity, and it's how much change, how, much, how many things have changed, what is the difference between your condition now and your condition when you're an upload. 
And um, we go through this all the time anyway, because we are all not the same person that we were when we were five years old, so clearly there is a continuous amount of change going on there. And there's a certain amount of change that's happening every moment when, when neurons are dying or reconnecting, something's going on in there. Um, so this gives you kind of a threshold level that we're used to that seems to be okay when we say, whatever we are is preserved, everything's working here. But if you're making an upload, you, can, you might be changing a lot of things. First of all, you could get quite a few things wrong so that there are differences in the state of the brain that you've created. Then there's the entire environment around it, which may be very different. So you've basically got a shock. It's kind of like you were just blown up in, in the battlefield or something. You might be going through shock, which could change you too. Yeah? I mean, I'm, just, I'm just sort of not... Uh expert on the matter, but I'm just following on Dennett's theory, as I, what he talked about theory of identity as a parliament. Maybe it's considered a parliament, you know, part of like a legislature, or political or whatever. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Consider the, yeah. the identity of a parliament of a country, of a, of, of a government, right, of a nation. Every 20 years, all the members change. They're all different. They may have a completely different ideological complexion, right? They may have moved the capital city, the parliament building. Everything, every aspect of its substrate may change, but it's still the parliament. You, is, that, is that sort of useful? Is that, is that, is that on what you're talking about? Or it it certainly illustrates the complexity of the question <laughs> because there are so many degrees. Because if the parliament is run in a way where, say, you have a two-party system mm -hmm. and you're replacing well, the entire party, then it's a, it might be different, right? Uh, how many people are changing at once? How much does the parliament change, and how does it change the direction of what they're talking about or what their ideas are? So, um, I mean, the same argument should, yeah. applies for itself, a human yeah. self, obviously. So, identity could come in degrees, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And continually dynamic in, the, in changing. Like we, our sense of who we are cannot be um, frozen in time, really. We're continually changing in multiple ways. And so our idea of it, of to me, it who sounds we like are, identity is a, is a convenient literary fiction. That we, you know, That's like possibly a label we put on the current so state if, of us. If this is a fiction, so you do believe that you are the same person when you wake up tomorrow morning, or you're a different person, or is it just fiction? As I said, <laughs> it's a convenient fiction. It, it makes me feel good. Happy. Okay. <laughs> I don't know whether it's true or not. <laughs> Rather than the same way we have it, we use that technique in literature. You know. I wanted to ask if any of the panelists wanted to ask each other a question. Um, what would you, Marcus, ask Randall and Colin? Okay, perfect. So, um, so <coughs> the major discrepancies I think we evened out at lunch. We're still friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Definite so um, it was definitely very interesting sort of to hear your opinion about uh, what science is and what it should be and uh, I have a little bit more clarity now um, so at the moment science is about you know you make experiments you come up with theories and you test these theories and what is a theory a theory is a model yeah um, I mean usually there's sort of I mean there's fringe yeah, but uh, a model which then to be careful then predicts um, your world or the phenomenon you study well and then you say this theory is correct or good or true or, or whatever yeah? um, and then you regard it also as an explanation you know okay Newton's law explains the motion of the planets yeah? well, well it predicts the motion of the planets and um, is that then an explanation or not I mean in historical times there was a problem okay that's distance a uh, force upon distance, you know, it's another local interaction, this is not really an explanation, yeah, but why not, yeah, and luckily now there's general relativity theory and, um, and then quantum theory, so the actions got local again, yeah, um, uh, but I mean, is locality important for, um, and to be an explanation or sufficient, yeah, so it seems that Colin makes a diff distinction between a model which predicts an explanation the why question, the how question, and causality. Yeah. With the last one, the causality, I can see there's some difference. Yeah. But with the other four, sort of, um, it's really hard to make distinctions on a fundamental level. 
So maybe you want to comment on that um, or explain that. All I'm doing is planting the seeds of the idea that it needs to be attended to. Um, I don't really have, you know, rigid, fixed definitions of the why, in the sense that you that would distinguish the why in the way that you you appreciate that difference. Um, what I I do know is that, that that addressing causality properly is going to be involved in dis, in explaining, not describing, explaining consciousness sufficiently to make a machine that is conscious and verifying it. And uh, I'd kind of like to leave it right there because there's there's really nowhere else for it to go. So. Uh, yeah. Marcus, do you have a, a burning question for Randall? Um, we agree too much, I think, yeah, so. <laughs> I know it's working a little bit. So, uh, no, I don't think so. Sorry. Okay, well, do you, I have a question for Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe agreement is not symmetric. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need a symmetry breaking event. This, this isn't so much about theory, it's about, it's about uh, practical questions. And it's actually about a practical question of what to do with AGI, um, so artificial general <coughs> intelligence. Um, creating a system that can be generally applicable across many different kinds of questions, so many different challenges, Obviously, it's a complex question, and, and it, it's correct to say that humans aren't necessarily the best example of an AGI, even though they're probably the one that we have most at hand that's closest to this, uh, because we are not a, a totally open system. We're not one that is, is completely flexible. We are built up of a ton of shortcuts that help us get things done quickly in a certain environment with certain challenges. The sort of corners of a bit that was also a bit about what my talk was about. Um, but it's practical because we can get things done in finite time. Now, if you're trying to make a universal artificial general intelligence, do you think that you also have to end up using a system that contains shortcuts and that therefore could perhaps learn from some of the shortcuts that were taken in the environments that you want to apply them to? Or could you keep it completely general? and still make it practicable? Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so you want more details? I'd like to <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, um, so first, um, let me emphasize um, why I think theory is so important. That was not really your question, but I mean, to give you a silly example, I mean, we have a knife or a simple definition of primes, but it's very hard to factor numbers, yeah? But you separate the issues. You have a definition, you have a knife algorithm to factorize numbers, and then you come up with more and more sophisticated algorithms. And just in recent years, a polynomial time algorithm has been invented, um, which is pretty amazing for not factoring, but for testing for primality. So it's a big, complicated subject, but you have this beautiful definition of primes. You know, more interesting example is quantum electrodynamics, which in principle describes all chemical processes, um, but not in practice. I mean, in practice you need all these effective theories, you need approximations, you need models, and so on. And I think the same is true for AI. I mean, this IC is a very cute formula, and you can study it theoretically, but if you really want to build it in practice, um, you have to put all kinds of modules in there, and um, they can be inspired yeah, um, from um, neurobiology or from anywhere and um, especially at the interface um, and then maybe if you move more and more to the core reasoning or general intelligence aspect so then maybe IC becomes more and more relevant um, so in this sense yes I agree and let me phrase it um, in a different way or, or, or let's let's take the neurobiological approach and forget about oh, this theory is useless or something like that yeah um, I think it's great to study the brain and try to sort of simulate it and understand it, but I think there are some very important um, things to um, detect, and I call it conservation laws. So think about in physics, um, you have figured out Newton's law, now you put that, you discretize it, put it in your computer, you simulate it, and what will happen? The planet will either collapse into the sun or will disappear, it will not work. Then you try to improve it, improve it, it will just not work. 
yeah? if you do it in an art way. And then you will realize, oh, there's something like energy conservation. And that is absolutely crucial that in any approximation, and also in the fundamental theory, energy is conserved. If you violate that in a tiny bit, things will explode or will die out. And um, nowadays, physics theories are so complex that even the fundamental theories are designed in such a way that automatically energy is conserved, and other quantities like momentum, angular momentum, and then quantum numbers, and so on. You have to design it, and you have to know that, otherwise things will not work. And I have the feeling, although I'm not a neurobiologist, that, um, that if you take this approach, there are various quantities which are very important to know of, and then in a simulation you have to take extra care that they are preserved. I mean, for instance, probably the average frequency of spiking you know, should be conserved. Somehow it should not die out, it should not explode. That is probably something which people know and is very important, right? Yeah. But I believe there are many, many more. Now maybe it's only five, you know? Maybe it's 20, hopefully it's not 100, yeah? And they have to be figured out. So if you go back to IXE, because it is based on a principle optimization principle, you don't have this problem. Yeah? It is sort of by construction optimal, and then you can prove various theorems. So it it cannot die out or explode or run into sort of the wrong direction. You know, maybe it does things which you don't like it to do, yeah, um, but it will not sort of die. Yeah? Um, well, that's sort of maybe the question. Back to you, um, is that um, an interesting approach or idea which people pursue to find sort of conserved quantities absolutely, in, in mind. Absolutely, yes. These yeah. kinds of balance questions, matters of conservation, and those are central questions that are addressed in, in the neuroscientific scientific literature when you look at things like um, how does excitation and inhibition, how must they be balanced, and things like that. So it's true that exactly those kind of fundamental questions are relevant to any sort of model of even just a portion of the mind, let's say of, of the brain, say the hippocampal uh, model that is supposed to work and that is supposed to sustain memories in a certain sense. So, yes, and I'm sure that there is plenty there that hasn't been found or figured out yet. So how many quantities, sort of, if you can count them, I don't know, have you sort of identified, so, I mean, the community has identified so far? Twelve and a half. No, I don't Twelve and a half, okay, <laughs> yeah, good, yeah. So I asked you later about these. Not thirteen. Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> you must be right. No, I mean, is that a sort of a... I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's a number, actually. Um, but I mean, afterwards, if we talk about you could sort of point me to a, list, to a list. reference yeah. well, where there's a list or so? Um, is there a reference list of all? No, you know, I think um, Maybe you should there are it in your some book. collections, some interesting collections of a variety of neuroscience, let's say, facts, things that have been found to be important. But um, I, I don't think that we've been really good at making those... Um, <coughs> making high quality lists like that and making them available or even known. That's, uh, and that's, I think, is extremely crucial to succeed. I think you're right. And if you look at some of the major projects out there, I think I may have briefly mentioned during the question and answer period yesterday, the Blue Brain Project. So no matter what you think about their, their angle, what, how they're building their model, one of the wonderful things that a big project like that does, and this is also true for the um, the Allen uh, Brain Atlas and, and those other big projects, is that they tend to do that. They tend to make a large field of exploration and then collect many different things that turn out to be very relevant. And they either just put them out as published literature or they include them in their model so that basically if you understand how the model works or you have access to the model, then you have access to these details. But yeah, that's not, a, not necessarily an ideal way of uh, making those available to everyone. Now, Colin, do you have any questions you'd like to ask Marcus and, um, um, and Randall? Well, um, not specifically. My mind's been caught up with the, the semantics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, during the last conversation, you heard the words simulation and model a lot. And I suppose... I, in this diversity of views that I'm trying to uh, encourage, in my uh, the, what, the chips that I'm building, there's no computing, none at all. Just like there's none in a brain. There's no models. It's a model aeroplane, if you like. It's, it actually flies. So 
I, it's not that I disagree with them. I, I, we're in two entirely different areas of activity, and all we can do is kind of look over the fence at each other and say, yep, yeah, pretty cool, hope it works. Um, so that's the divide that I feel here. Um, I, I find that... I tried to highlight this with a question yesterday. Artificial intelligence, to me, is not computing. It's been presupposed to be computing ever since the word was invented in Dartmouth in '56 with the guys. What's his name? He did it. I've forgotten the name of the guy who coined the phrase. McCarthy. McCarthy. Yeah, he died recently. Didn't he? Yeah. And uh, everyone's thinking you must build a computer when you're making artificial intelligence, and I'm saying, hey guys, artificial is not necessarily computing. No, it's mathematics. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, no you don't. I mean, if you want to make artificial fire, you don't compute fire or mathematics fire. Yeah, can I, can I respond you burn stuff. Me? Because we've talked about this before, and I really think this is a matter of terminology. Because when you ask yeah. an actual, when you ask neuroscientists in general, the ones who are making these models or the ones who are building neuromorphic chips, <coughs> other neuromorphic chips, not mm. the ones you're making, but other ones that are also supposed to build devices that work like a neuron, even if they don't have the exact same theories of what may be important in there. They are building devices that do something, but they most definitely talk about things like computation and models, because they're using models as representations because when they're building yeah. their system, and they're talking about computations that go on in their system, and people talk about these terms in relationship mm -hmm. to exactly all those kinds of activities all the time, and I think it's just a matter of how, um, how much you you nitpick exactly about what you call a computation. Because when, like what Marcus just said, you just say, no, it's mathematics. That's much mm -hmm. bigger than saying it's, it has to be, you know, bits and bytes or something like that. Ooh, here we are in those two paddocks again. Um, the natural world as computation and a computer model of the natural world are two entirely different things in the manner of a map and a territory. And I, I don't want to stop anyone doing what you're doing or what the com computationalists are doing. I just want people to understand that there's another way of doing it and that it's got much more historical precedent than anything that's ever been tried. The com computing's only 50 years old. The technique that I'm employing is a million years old. Gronk the caveman was burning stuff to make dinner. He knew nothing about it. He didn't wait till he had a theory of combustion before he made dinner. <laughs> Right? Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make cognition with the physics, not a model of the physics, like you can get a Hodge, Hodgkin's Huxley compartmental model, that's what my thesis was about, and you can build it in components, and it's a, and it's a component model of, of a thing, okay. and it will this behave in a way that replicates some observable phenomena, but it's not the original. And this I'm is, building this the original. This is where we get back to the, the conversation that we had about um, <coughs> bird flight and plane flight. And in this case, it's thinking in a machine, thinking in a human brain. It's true that building a model of something in the natural world, like a model of fire, is not the same thing as a fire. Just like writing down an equation about something that goes on in the brain is not the same as having an operation that's running on a device. But if I write down an equation and I'm running it in a simulation in a computer, where it can take input, like it can look at something and do object recognition, just like your brain could do object recognition, it's carrying out the same task, just as a plane built of wood could fly, just as a bird can fly. It's carrying out the same task, the same performance, the same operation. That's the thing that you're capturing when you make something like that. It's, it's, it's I would, I, I, okay, well then in terms of an exploration, I intend to explore the function of the brain by building the actual physics. Yeah, so what you're probably Not a model of it. That's, that's what I'm saying. And, and in regards to uh, black box um, functionality, the thing you just described, you pointed to your head and said, you know, output is what, what my head did with a model. It's not what your head did with a model at all. There's some physics in your brain which presented it to you as an experience. And that's what I want to recreate. Of course. And I'm not saying that my head was using a model. What I'm saying is that when we talk about building a model, we're talking about coming up with an understanding, as in mathematical equations, of something that you can put into the device, whether it's a digital computer or some other device that can carry out the processing that you're doing. Right. But I think what Colin is saying, he doesn't want to build models and he doesn't believe that making a simulation is 
the best way in order to achieve the goal. He's probably yeah, saying understand. that. Um, yeah. Built it rather than build yes. the model, yeah. but that is true maybe for some things. You know, making a real fire is much more easier than making a model of a yeah, fire, I'd right? But for, easy. but for other <laughs> things, you know, um, I think building a computer, you know, without you know having a model of a computer, the gates and so how it works, you know, just by looking at the physics and building it would be very hard nowadays. You know, maybe the early mechanical computers they just use the cogwheels and uh, so on and just build yeah. it. But they also had plans, you know, they had plans. We're in a better position right. now than we ever have been to, to do such construction you know, in terms of microfabrication and so on. But you don't start I constructing very, things without yeah. sort of first having a I have plan. a very hard yeah, time believing you don't have models. Because how oh yeah, I've, I've got steps. stuff written down which describes how to build something. Exactly. But I'm not That's building a model. a model of the thing. That's I mean, a, an aeroplane... Yeah. But he doesn't want to simulate the model in a computer, but just build it directly. Right. Yeah. So okay. It, yeah. Let's go between the bird and the. the Colin, sorry. Yeah. Can your system run on a Turing machine? Repeat the question. Please. No. You say no. Repeat the question. Can my system run on a Turing machine? No. No. And that's a fundamental difference. <laughs> right. That, that, that would be, but that's, but that wasn't really what we were discussing. Yeah, it's but not a computable, computation. in the classic sense yeah, of computation. Sure. That's the, the fundamental of the, yeah. the problem, the, surely. It's, uh, I'm only, like I said, I'm in a totally different paddock. So you, you don't believe that the universe is computable? I thought you believed that the universe is computable. No, the, the universe is, it's not a computation of a model. It is computation. But if the universe is computation, then everything which is inside the universe can be simulated by a computer. I mean, with some limits because, you know, we have size limits. In the case of artificial... In okay, here's one. Yes, you can simulate a brain. Yeah. But you'd have to simulate the entire universe in order to make that brain behave like the original. So you wouldn't bother. But what if you just put it in the universe? It has input and output just like that. Then the it wouldn't be like the brain. I'm not following you there. You, you, you don't, without the environment, the, the but description... But the there, you're using the actual environment. No, you're not. Input and output. You're using a measurement of a different thing altogether. But our senses are making measurements. Yeah, and, but we don't use them. Yes, we don't do. use the peripheral sensing at all. Everything that we perceive is up here. All the qualia. How does it get there? Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> The perception, the qualia are in the head. All right. We've got one question from the audience over here. No comments. No comments. <laughs> no comments. <laughs> questions. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I just, I have no need of it. Algorithm. I, I mean, let, let's say that the basic logic gate that I'm involved with has has these two resonating cross-coupled phenomena. One called action potential, little pulses, and another one which is an electromagnetic field, which influences other similar resonators nearby. And they're coupled, and they do a dance. There's no model there. Maybe let's agree. There's, there's just stuff happening. Let's agree that you can not, model it. Not that's it. not every phenomenon, it's the most useful way to think about how can I computationally model it. Maybe that's not always the useful, most useful yeah. approach to it's think about it, although you could do it. I believe and maybe he said, you could not do it, but it's maybe not always the most useful way to do yeah. it. Okay, maybe we should proceed to I mean, this is other like questions. A problem that with every vet, for a man with only a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that, that nail or the, that hammer is a computer. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a question for Colin. I mean, I, I, this is the first I've heard of your type of uh, simulating the brain without actually using... I'm not simulating brain. anything. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> See how he, hard it is to talk like this? No, it's I really difficult. Uh, but I'm, I'm just wondering how it actually works. I mean, how do you get... Well, I'll build it and then I'll work it out and I'll let you know. <laughs> right? That's what I'm doing, for real. I'm not... This is an, an exploration by building the thing, not not an exploration of a model of a thing. So it's it's just a way of doing things which is is not the uh, way people have been thinking about it much in this area. It, ever since day one, they've been thinking brains are computers. The trial and error approach. 
Um, yeah, in effect, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Trial and error, but with the actual physics. Okay, one for Andrew Dunn over there. And can you please repeat the question? Um, so, uh, just trying to, for my own sake, clarity on your position, Colin. It sounds like this notion uh, that you have that what you're doing is not modelling or computation could be based maybe on one of three things that there is either uh, a connectionist kind of framework for the way your system is operating, or that the primary thing is that representation within the system is distributed in some way, rather than symbolic, or just that you feel that the key thing here is that you're dealing with continuous rather than discrete quantities. Uh, so one question would be, is it more about non-symbolic computation or more about continuous quantities? And if it's more about continuous quantities, would you be open to the notion that, for example, an analog computer as opposed to a digital computer could be a suitable substrate for the kind of system that we're looking at. Okay, continuous. The the thing, the physics that I'm involved with, it doesn't fit into the into the classical compartments of, of digital, in the sense that we mean a digital computer. Sure. Certainly, discrete things are going on in a quantum mechanical sense. And to the extent that that becomes continuum um, after a certain spatial temporal scale, then there's a continuum involved because this is just raw physics. And now I've forgotten the second half of the question. So analog circuits, analog computing. Analog computing. Yeah, I'm I'm old enough to have used an analog computer. <laughs> okay, um, they're horrible things. They drifted everywhere and uh, yuck. Anyway, but once again, you are building a model of something. Okay, so the the I'm not building a model of anything. There is no modelling going on. They they just as they're useful things, and the idea of an analog computer is one that I've considered a lot. But I'm not computing anything. I'm not That's manipulating it. symbols, which brings me to another part of your question. Yes, it's a highly connectionist idea in that all these these little resonating things are massively interconnected. Um, at multiple scales, That's, so there's connectionism there. As to the uh, emergence of symbols, the symbols are distributed in the manner that you imagine it. Uh, how do I say? If you could imagine a lens that has an image in it re constructed in real time and that you could only see it by being the lens, then that's what these chips will actually do. And you have to be the chip to see the image. So can I just throw in very quickly, another Melbourneite, Tim Van Gelder. Um, hey, I know Tim. Known for him, so work, work on yeah. Dynamicism. Um, he wrote a paper, What Might Cognition Be If yeah, Not Computation? Yeah. Um, where he likens cognition to a what steam governor, so that the way the governor of the steam engine works doesn't contain any modelling or variables, but it's simply a mechanism that, that responds governs. in yeah. the required way to yeah. the system. This, is, yeah. is that... Is that that's to the that's, here? Is it the that's kind of it. it um, except I would make it way more complex than that. In the, it's, a, it's a high dimensional dynamical system and it, it's, you can regard it as a crystal that's right on the boundaries of a phase change all the time. When it's not, you're either dead or asleep, or alternatively, hyperactive means you're having an epileptic fit, where you've got almost um, no information in your head, but there's an incredible amount of activity. Uh, and it's departures to and from this, this um, phase change that are actually the process that you observe it's involved in the cognition, um, the gamma band temporal coherence that was on that list today. That that right there is where that phase change is navigated to and from. Uh, I can't make it any simpler than that. I'd like to um, maybe 
had a phase of change in yeah. the direction of the panel. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> and, uh, There's a long-term question. <laughs> There's a hand over there for five minutes already, maybe. Yeah. Rest that hand. Let's have it. <laughs> <laughs> it is it a changing direction know, question or? <laughs> You just contradicted yourself, all right? I'm using the physics. I'm not using the laws of physics. Right? I'm, uh, if, if I was to use this as a shock absorber, then I'd be doing that. <laughs> right? I'm using the physics of this thing to do that. I'm not using a mathematical model, a law that, of, of shock absorption to simulate the cushioning. It's so really, you know, when I say physics, I mean the natural world. Perhaps I should, re well, arbitrarily, can you replace all instances of the word physics with the natural world from now on, whenever I say it? And then you get closer to what I mean. Okay, so what yeah, the actual natural about? world. Yeah. What are you optimistic about with regard to the future of intelligence? Randall. Randall. Okay. Um, I, I'm very optimistic about the way that uh, new tools are being developed in neuroscience right now, and those are really crucial to the entire undertaking. Because when Marcus was just alluding to finding all of these important uh, main uh, fundamental features of what needs to be put in place and needs to needs to work so that a, a upload an upload can take place. A lot of this has to do with being able to examine the system that we have properly. And, um, and we never had those tools before. So this is really the major advance that's been going on over the last maybe decade, maybe a little bit longer, that we've gone into an area where now we're beginning to look at things at large scale and high resolution. And that is something that is very important because then we can finally um, get the data that we need to build the models if I'm allowed to use that word, um, for the, the, the systems that we're trying to produce. So, um, and, and um, yeah, I, that's, I don't want to go back to the previous um, discussion necessarily, but I was very curious about how you go about making a system without doing things like carrying out such measurements and, and therefore collecting data, which automatically means you're working with representations. But we can talk about that <laughs> later if you want to. Anyway, I'm very optimistic about the data collection aspect. Uh -huh. Okay, um, what I'm optimistic about, um, so maybe a bit more general, say, assuming that humanity doesn't destroy itself, which may happen, um, I think there will be lots of technological process, progress in all kinds of fields, and um, it seems to happen at an accelerating pace, at least not decelerating, and the pace is already quite good. Um, so, AGI has advanced significantly in various directions. Um, well, one direction is we have a theory now, which is, I think, very useful for further progress. And, um, yeah, I'm optimistic, as long as we don't destroy ourselves, that there will be exciting future times, and I'm looking forward to all these new inventions um, which will be fun, and some of them, of course, will be useful. I mean, sort of, you know, curing cancer, prolonging the lifespan, and you know, these um, ancient dreams may become true too. And I will talk more about the future at 3 p.m. Cool. It's in the future as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. wow, freaky. Um, okay, optimism. Optimism. Um, right. Optimism. <laughs> <laughs> Keep pressing that brain. <laughs> All right. Um, stimulate you. Stimulate me. Um, I think I have a. I can highly relate to the motivations expressed by Randall. In that, the reason why I got into this area in the first place is that we need help, and we're going to need a lot of help in the quite near future to cope with all the challenges and that the, the, 
the structure of civilization, if you'd like to be so lofty as that, is entering into a, uh, a sort of quasi-dynamic state that could go anywhere. We have an opportunity with the resources we have now to actually deal with some of these problems right away, and I'd rather do it sooner than later, because later uh, it could be just too late. So uh, I was actually originally thinking of my kids, believe it or not. What's the sort of world I want to leave behind down the track? And uh, making smart machines that can assist in, and become things that we can't become uh, seemed like a really handy way of doing things. Uh, there are so many applications, it's ridiculous. I'm not actually much interested in uploading uh, or replicating humans. What I am interested in is creating smart machines that can be taught, coached like we are, and do stuff on our behalf. Anything from killing cane toads to um, helping the elderly. And the chips themselves can actually be used as implants. Uh, and so my motivations are along those lines. If I build a critter which is as adaptable as us, but it, its brain doesn't really operate exactly like us, but it's got the same principles, then I'll be happy. So uh, uploading is not a concern of mine. I think we've got bigger problems to deal with. So I'm optimistic that I can do that. I'll have an ant in about five years, I think. Something with the intelligence of an ant. I think I can do that. The chip technology is up to it. The numbers are not that big. So there's my optimism. These questions, like personal identity, um, they're sort of already a level beyond what we should be asking. Because the first thing you should be asking is, what's the goal of your project in the first place? What are you trying to achieve and why? And a lot of people will have somewhat different goals, but there are many that overlap in some area. And then you've got enough momentum to carry out a project that's interesting. And so the project to do whole brain emulation, for example, is one where we find that there is some agreement on what we would find an interesting or what we would call success, a successful outcome of the project. And, um, and I think, yeah, that's, that's exactly where the questions need to be asked. And, and then, you know, whether you're comfortable with the result yourself is really a question of whether you agree with that same measure as a successful upload. If I might add, perhaps on that I'm just wondering at what requirements you would have to sign up to upload yourself. Any things that you would specify are mandatory for your... What would be mandatory for me? Yeah, I think uh, mandatory would be to retain um, just about as much access to the knowledge that I have right now so that uh, I feel like that's been preserved. Uh, I'd like to be able to talk to women. <laughs> <laughs> this, that's, that's actually not, that's, that's not, a, that's not a bad point because that was going to be my, basically my second point, which is things that we don't often think of as knowledge. Uh, because when we think of knowledge, memory, people talk, it's terminology again, they talk about things like, oh, do you remember this person and their face? But really, Memory and knowledge is everything that has shaped how you react. So this is why a concert pianist plays a piece in a certain way. So that's also part of his knowledge. And, and whether you're able to go up to women and talk to them, and things like that, it's all part of that. So this is what makes you you. And that would have to be preserved to enough of a degree, a degree where I would say, yeah, this is not so much different than, than I am different now from uh, certain moments before. Interesting question because it leads to something else that, that I was going to mention at one point about this matter of continuity and, and what do you accept or is acceptable in terms of differences between you now and some recreated you and 
does the question of personal identity matter at all? I think if you get to the absurd, it does matter. Because if you were to take the completely outrageous assumption that it doesn't matter how much of a, say, uh, difference there is between um, your experience of the environment right now and the experience of the environment when you get recreated or something like that, so that larger gaps are perfectly permissible and it doesn't matter if you've been turned on for a hundred years and now you are reawakened in the state that you would have if you had experienced those hundred years. So you're actually a different person. There's not a direct connection between your experience when you went to sleep and the experience when you reawoke. But they instead, they made it the you who would have existed if you had been awake those hundred years. I don't think that that would be the same. That would not preserve personal identity. It would be just as different as if you had created someone completely different. So. There are some aspects of continuity that matter. Does it go out the back of the head of the This is going to get back to the topic that's a bit complicated, but just to get my mind a bit more focused, to Colin, um, would I be right in saying that your approach is more akin to like a biomimicry sort of approach? Or is that you know, shooting a bit far? No, no. Um, okay, once again, I'll be very careful. Yes, I want to mimic what's going on, but I don't want to um, model what's going on. I want it to actually do what's being done in the brain. So, yeah, yeah, that's a better terminology. Um, there are various terms. I haven't figured out which one it is yet. It might become clear over time, and then I'll be able to we'll be able to write a definition and know that Colin's in you know, that camp over there. At the moment, it's I have terminological issues. But yeah, bio, bio, there's biomimetics, is another term. Yeah, yeah. And uh, for women, it's uh, social dynamics and um, evolution arts. <laughs> cool, okay. <laughs> Thanks for that tip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. So I'd like to close the panel. Thank you very much for your participation.